Well, hey guys, how you doing? From wherever you are all around the world tuning in today. My name is Rowan. It's a great honor to come and bring you the word today here from Wine Press in Berwick. One thing you've got to know about Wine Press is that uh, our purpose is to be disciples and to make disciples. So we love helping people journey through understanding who Jesus is. And we're going to see that in today's passage. We're going to get into John chapter 3 in a moment. Before we get to John chapter 3, I just want to give a shout out. Actually, it's more than a shout out. I, I want to honor the soldiers of Australia, whether you're in the military, uh, to, to whatever degree you are, uh, if you serve this great nation. I just want to take a moment. If you are outside of Australia, let me just say today, today is Anzac Day. And uh, we reflect and we remember a war that was fought in Gallipoli uh, between the New Zealand army joining forces with the Australian army and to go and battle against the Turks. And uh, it was a, a bloody battle. It was horrific. And a lot of lives were lost. And so we reflect on that day because a lot of people gave their life for this great nation. But I also, in a second, I want to lift up all of the soldiers all around this great nation because they pay an amazing price and do an incredible job. So uh, right now, would you do that as we just lift them up? Father God, Father in Jesus' name, Father, we thank you for the Anzacs. We thank you for the lives that were lost, that were given for this great nation in battle. Uh, Father, we ask that you would continue to restore lost relationship for our army soldiers. And uh, we thank you for restoring the the, the relationships between the Turks and the Australians and the New Zealanders, uh, those that were at war. We thank you, God, that you are a God of restoration. And Father, for every soldier around this great nation, uh, we, we pray that all of them would come to know you. But we thank you that they are prepared to give their life to defend this great nation. Father, bless them and protect them. Um, and, and may they see you. May they know you. May they understand that there is a reason to give their life. And that reason is Jesus Christ. And Father, we lift up the Word of God right now. As we come around the Word of God, Father, we pray for your anointing. We understand that the Word of God is spirit. So we ask for your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Come on. Come on, somebody. Uh, we've been going through the book of John, John chapter 3. Uh, so when Pastor Arthur, who's not here this morning, when Pastor Arthur said, Ron, could you preach? I said, yeah, yeah, sure. Where are we up to? And he said, well, where are you up to? And I remember the last time I preached was John chapter 2. And it talks about Jesus flipping all the tables in the synagogues. And he said, okay, well, just jump into John chapter 3. I was like, can, can I preach John 3, 16? He's like, yeah. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. I'm like, really? He said, Stop asking the question, you're preaching. And, and then I started to read it. And I was like a little boy. I was like, yeah, John 3.16. And as I got in it, I was like, I can't just preach John 3.16. Preachers far better than me could preach John 3.16. But I'm Rowan. And for me to give you an understanding of John 3.16, I've got to, to move forward. I've got to come back. To land in John 3.16, I've got to start at the start. Um, and, and so that's what we're going to do. Have you ever had a moment where you sit down to have a coffee with someone and what transpires, what unfolds from that point is the most beautiful conversation where you are brought to, uh, what is brought to light is something that you've never considered. It, it could be that you just get a great revelation of what you're doing in your current job, that your boss sits, to, sits you down and tells you how you could be doing it better. It could be, you know, maybe that you sat down and this was the moment in a cafe where uh, you're, uh, the person that you're madly in love with just popped the question. You know, so many things unfold in, in, in cafe spaces. And so often we sit down to have conversations and we're not prepared to have heaven invade our world in a beautiful way. And I say that because I want to paint the picture very strongly, very clearly, that that is what is about to happen to this guy called Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes in and like I said, scholars say that Nicodemus would have seen Jesus flipping the tables. We know everything we need to know about Nicodemus in John chapter 3 verse 1. So it says this, it says, there was a man of the Pharisees. So straight away we know that, that Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's a teacher of the law and he's a teacher of scripture. And it says, named Nicodemus. So straight away, again, we know that he is a Pharisee. We know that his name being Nicodemus, that there's wealth there because it's a Greek name. So he, he has some understanding of a Greek culture, which talks of wealth. And a ruler of 
the Jews. As being a ruler of the Jews meant that he was also part of the Sanhedrin, which was a governing body of the Jews. They, 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 were, like, um, they were like the upper courts, so, so to speak. So in John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we know everything we need to know about this guy called Nicodemus. He was an intelligent guy. He saw Jesus going crazy uh, in the temples. One of his roles, though, was to, one of Nicodemus' roles was to follow up teachers and rabbis and make sure that what they were teaching, um, they weren't going to raise, raise, raise up a whole heap of heretics. And so the Bible says that he goes to him at night. In verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. We're going to stop there. Remember, we want to land in John 3.16, but to move forward, we've got to come back. Nicodemus knows everything that there is to know about law. Nicodemus knows everything there is to know about the, the Jewish culture. That's where the Pharisees came out of. Nicodemus knew everything that there was to know in his mind about Scripture. Nicodemus, in a, in, a few, in a few scriptures, Jesus would actually relate to Nicodemus as the teacher. The teacher, not a teacher, but the teacher, the main teacher, the head teacher. So even in that, talks about a, a hierarchy of teachers and tells us that Nicodemus was right up there. It's not very often that Nicodemus would have sat down in a cafe, so to speak, and got schooled. It's not often that Nicodemus would have sat down in a cafe and had someone that could talk rings around him and confuse him and say, could you please explain? But that is exactly what is about to happen to Nicodemus. And so the scene is set. A lot of preachers say that Nicodemus was fearful and it went at night time. But just as many scholars say that according to Jewish law, uh, the evening was set aside to go into the deep things of Jewish study. And so it makes perfect sense when you understand that. It makes perfect sense that Nicodemus would have actually gone to Jesus in the quiet of the night. And maybe he saw Jesus and he said, I can't actually get to him during the day. I want to ask one question. Who are you? Even though John chapter 1, he, he comes and he says all these things. We know that you're a teacher sent from God because who else could do these things? There was still, uh, there was still a question in Nicodemus. I, I need to find out who this guy is. And Jesus, well, he's going to play the role of savage Jesus. He bypasses the niceties. He, he doesn't even acknowledge that Nicodemus has just said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. And he just says, Jesus answered and said to him, verse 3, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus replies and he says, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We're going to move through the scripture. We're going to talk uh, about some of this scripture. We're going to land in John 3.16. But I want to focus on the life that Nicodemus lived. Because I believe Nicodemus' life that he lived uh, tells us everything we need to know about the gospel and how this life can unfold. So here we go. So Nicodemus wants to find out the quintessential question. Who are you? And he leads with niceties, like we know who you are. And Jesus says, hey, you got to understand this. Let's just get to the crux of it. I'm telling you that you got to be born again. And everything in Nicodemus, everything that he knows, everything that he understands, the wisdom, the knowledge, the studies, there is no reference point in him that talks about someone being born again. And Jesus is telling him, unless you get born again, that you're not going to see the kingdom of God. I talk to so many people, so many people that go, are you one of those born again Christians? But the reality is, church, there's only one type of Christian that we can be. And that is the born again Christian. And if they want to call us happy clappies, then go with it because we're Pentecostal. But there's only one type of Christian. And that is the born again Christian. 
We have to be born again to see ourselves as Christ-like. And everything in Nicodemus is wrestling with this teacher that this rabbi is bringing. Everything in him. And so they go back and forward. Remember, there's one question that he wants to answer. Who are you? And Jesus leads straight into, you've got to be born again. You've got to be born again. But you've got to be born again of the Spirit, Nicodemus. Nicodemus being the teacher that he was, the, the student that he was growing up, studying everything. He understood that the Jewish culture was preparing and waiting for a Jew, a ruler that would come to be king and usher in a new world. Not for a second did he believe or think that the ruler would actually usher in a new life. But how often does heaven wrestle with our knowledge? And how often does heaven wrestle with everything we know and we fight faith because of our head knowledge and then we cry out for more faith, but because we don't allow faith to work out in our life because it makes no sense. We never see Jesus move in our world. And everything from an academic point of view was being challenged and wrestled with inside Nicodemus. And so Nicodemus says, I can't be born again. And then uh, I, I can't climb up into my mother's room. And mom's probably going, well, that's, that's, thank you, Jesus, for that. But most assuredly, Jesus says, unless you come in to the kingdom via the Spirit, you're not going to see the kingdom. And he goes on and talking. And in verse 9, Nicodemus answers and says to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel, and do not know these things. Jesus was about to reveal himself like nothing else to the teacher of Israel. Let me paint the picture for you again. Just imagine that. It's the dead of the night. Nicodemus and Jesus are kicking back in a cafe. Maybe they're at Starbucks or one of your favorite cafes. And there in the corner is John writing down everything that's happening. So at the table, you've got Jesus. Jesus knows who he is. Jesus is the son of the living God. Jesus is the son of the living God. You've got Nicodemus, who's come to ask the quintessential question of who are you? And then in the corner, you've got John, who knows, who's riding away, who's probably looking at the lips going, ha ha, come on, Jesus, just tell him who you are. Just show him who you are. Because remember, John wrote in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John was a lunatic. John was crazy. He was a lunatic for Jesus, but he was sold. He didn't ask the question, who are you? John declares straight away, you are Jesus, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. So he's there riding away and, 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 and there's this person trying to figure out who Jesus is and Jesus is, is dropping bombs all around him and Nicodemus, because of his understanding, you see church, our understanding of what we think we know will often get in the way of what God is trying to teach us. And right here in verse, verse, uh, verse 14, it says this, Jesus is still talking. It says, and Moses, this, Jesus is revealing himself to Nicodemus, but Nicodemus cannot understand it. Nicodemus can't see it because of everything that he knows, because of who he is and what Jesus is saying is challenging everything that is in Nicodemus. And in verse 15, 14, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You know, there was a time back in, I think it's the book, in, in the book of Numbers, where Moses is moving his people through the wilderness and all these snakes are biting God's people. And God's people are dying, dropping dead. So Moses goes, God, I, I, what are we doing? What's happening? And God says, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're going to make it a snake out of bronze. And you're going to tie it to a stick and you're going to hold it up. And tell the people, Moses, everyone that looks up at the bronze snake is going to live. They're going to survive. They're going to get through. Everyone that looks up is going to survive. And this is what Jesus says. And as Moses lifted up the serpent... In the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should not perish. And as soon as Jesus starts to say, and as Moses lifted up the servant, I just reflect back on maths. Maths? 
How do we go from Moses lifting up a sermon to mass? Thanks, great question. Mr. Barton was my math teacher, and uh, he, he, he was, to me, he was a better friend than he was a math teacher. I'm not saying he wasn't a great math teacher, I just never understood math. Mr. Barton would say, Rowan, could you please answer this question? I'd stand up and I'd, I was that kid. So, you know, I, he'd be going, uh, what, what is uh, the square root of 27? And I'd be going, I'd stand up and I'd be trying to bide time. I'd be that kid going, so what you're asking is the, the square root of 27. And as I asked myself that question out loud to try and look intelligent 14 times, I would start to get confident because I'm not even addressing the question. But I, here's my point. I imagine as soon as Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent, there is something in Nicodemus that goes, finally, I've caught up to the conversation. I understand that because I've studied that. I knew what Moses did. So when Jesus says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and Nicodemus says, yep, yep, I've got to understand that. Moses built the snake. Moses made the snake. They looked at the snake. Wasn't snakes on a plane, snakes in the desert. And as they looked at that, they got saved and they got through that part of the wilderness. But then he goes on and he says, even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. What, what do you mean, Jesus? Are you going to walk through the wilderness and are we going to make a bronze statue? And Jesus was actually telling him, that I am going to be nailed on a cross and everyone's eyes who are elevated to me, everyone's eyes that fall upon me, everyone's eyes that connect with me and believe in me, they are going to be saved. And that's what he's saying to Nicodemus before he launches in to the most famous scripture in this whole wide world. And I've got a couple of minutes to talk about it. And out of that, he says... John 3.16, he says this, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And as he starts to say that, I imagine that Nicodemus got confused again, going from Moses in the desert to I'm feeling confident to hold on, Jesus I've been confused with everything, but now I understand a little and I'm confronted by it. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. Nicodemus would have understood that the God that he served loved the Jews. So to make a statement, for God so loved the Jews, would have sat on Nicodemus's heart and he would have been okay with that. But straight away, Nicodemus is wrestling internally with the hold on. How, what, what are you saying? Are you saying God loves everything? Church, you've got to understand that this, this scripture, for God so loved the world, this is a scripture that was said, but then it stands outside time. What does that mean, Ron? What does it mean, stands outside time? Jesus said, for God so loved the world. What does that mean? That means that God loved everyone that was, everyone that is, and He is madly, intimately, relentlessly in love with people yet to be born. That's, that, that's, the scripture stands outside time. I'm spitting a lot, so I'm grateful that there's not a front row. But I'm excited at this. It challenges me because I, it reminds me that God so loved the world. He is calling sinners like me and you. And he's calling people that think that they're not sinners. And he's calling the Jews and the Romans and the Greeks and the South Africans and the Ethiopians and everyone else in between. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And Nicodemus was probably there going, Jesus keeps talking about life. He keeps talking about life. But we're waiting for this new world to come in. What's this new world going to look like? What's this new ruler going to look like? And there in front of him sits Jesus, who is ushering in a new life. We don't know what happened at the end of this cafe session with Nicodemus and Jesus. But we see fragments of Nicodemus' life throughout the Gospel of John that tell us that maybe we can't be like John in that John's revelation of Jesus is so tight. In the beginning, there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
That was John's revelation. But Nicodemus gives us hope to say that maybe we can uh, take a little bit of time to understand who Jesus is. And if we don't have that revelation straight away, that's okay because it's all in God's time and in God is going to have our way in until the moment where we see Jesus lifted up on the cross. And we can say, Jesus, I believe in you. Will you come into my heart? And we're spiritually reborn. So here are three things that we see in Nicodemus's life. We see Nicodemus in John chapter 3, uh, verse 1, come as the inquirer. Jesus, I want to know who you are. Jesus, tell me a little bit about yourself. And so many of us, isn't that how we first come to God? We ask questions, we inquire of him. But then we see later on in John chapter 7, Nicodemus says, says this, when they're trying to arrest Jesus and they're sending soldiers out to get Jesus and bring him back, and Nicodemus says, hold on, our, our, does our law says, say judge a man before we give him a hearing? And some people say that, that Nicodemus should have spoken up more. Some scholars, some theologians say that based on his faith, if he really was a disciple of Jesus after that first cafe session, Nicodemus should have just said, hey, stop chasing this guy. But he didn't. He just reflects on the law and he says, hold up, hold up. Our law says we've got to give someone a trial and you're trying to just lock them up. And they basically tell them to be quiet. And they send out some more soldiers to go and get Jesus. And then the third place that we see Nicodemus is John chapter 13, verse 38. And in Nicodemus, it says he's there with another young man. And he says, with some myrrh and aloe and 75 pounds in weight to prepare the body of Jesus. So he's brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe and 75 pounds in weight, as in all those things weighed 75 pounds. According to Jewish, Jewish culture, Nicodemus was about to bury Jesus in the way that kings were buried. All of that from a cafe session at night. He sat down and he sat from a, a, across the table, the most amazing man that ever lived. And Jesus had the ability to bypass all his academia had the ability to bypass all of the cultural things he thought he understood, had the ability to, to, to give him a glimpse into who he was. And Nicodemus finds himself now wrapping up Jesus like a king so that he could be buried and laid to rest. And again, even, even now, scholars and theologians um, ridicule Nicodemus and say, well, why did he do that so quietly? Why didn't he fight? Why didn't he declare his faith? So what you've got to understand is I, I am a type, I'm a type of Nicodemus in that if we look at Discipleship 101, here's what happened in the life and the world of Nicodemus. One, he came in the quiet of the night and he inquired of Jesus. Church, we have to make sure that we never stop inquiring of this God that we want to understand and serve and worship. There's so much about him that we don't know. And we know a little bit and we take it and we run. And it's a little bit that doesn't sustain our walk. And then God goes, there's so much more. And Nicodemus thought he had everything and he knew everything. And then Jesus has to say to him, I thought you were the teacher. So there's always more church, but I'm an inquirer, just like Nicodemus. I'm that little annoying kid saying, why? Why? Are we there yet? Why do we do that? When should we do that? Can we change it up? The second thing Nicodemus was, was, did was that he started to find his voice. And we have a look and we see this in John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Let me see if I can find it. It says here, it says, Then the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? And then further down in 47, uh, actually in verse 50, it says this. So here's Nicodemus again. And it says this in brackets. He who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our Lord judge a man before he hears him and knows what he is doing? The Pharisees are trying to lock Jesus up for no reason other than they're afraid of their authority and their power being challenged. And Nicodemus stands there as part of this group and he manages to find a voice. And even though the theologians still ridicule him because all he said was, Hey, doesn't our law say that... Uh, we, we, we shouldn't judge a man before we give him a year in. That's all. He, you know, sometimes when we don't say anything, it says everything about who we are. There was a little boy I used to hang out with back in uh, school days. And he's, let's call him Dave. And Dave, Dave and I were really good mates. 
And I would play with Dave at recess and at lunchtime. And then I'd go away from Dave and I'd go into the classrooms. And when I went to the classrooms, everyone would talk about this other kid, this smelly kid that was at school. And they all said to me, Rowan, if you see this kid, don't play with him, don't hang out with him. What I didn't realise was that the kid that they were talking about was Dave. And then one lunchtime, Dave and I were playing with cars in a mud puddle and uh, a group of boys came over, started calling him Smelly Dave. And in that moment, as nice as a kid that I was, I said absolutely nothing. And I realised later that when we say nothing, when we should speak up, it says everything about us. And it tells the truth about us. I was never friends with Dave ever again. But here's the kick. I found out many years later, my mum went and started to help people in the community. And I found that she was working with a woman who had a son called Dave. And my mum said, I think you used to go to school with Dave. And I said, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. And I never told her the story of me being silent and saying, hey, Dave and I are good mates. Leave him alone. I should have said that, but I didn't. My mum tells me that uh, the family was so hard on money that um, the mum had to make a choice. Do I put food on the table or do I wash their clothes? She chose to put food on the table. And in that moment, I chose to stay quiet. And my silence spoke more about me than any words I could have said. And Nicodemus is faced with the same challenge. Do I say anything amidst the Pharisees? And he finds his voice. So Nicodemus is an inquirer. He finds that still small voice. In Discipleship 101, then he start, it starts to manifest in his actions. And we see in verse, uh, in, in John 19, it says this, Nicodemus comes. And uh, let's turn to there, actually. It says, Nicodemus goes to Jesus with this other guy by the name of uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And it says this in verse 39, And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about a hundred pound. About a hundred pound. I think earlier I said 75, it's a hundred. And, and so G, G, it's now manifesting in his actions. And as I said before, he got the burial of a king. Nicodemus's world was changing from, I think, after watching this guy flip tables, I need to inquire about him. I think I believe him. He's not just a great teacher and a prophet. He is the salvation and the saviour of the world. And then he moves from that to manifesting discipleship in his world by actually going and preparing the body for burial. Nicodemus' world was being challenged and it was being shaped. And I said at the very start, I think that, that I just wanted to preach in John 3.16. One of the things, one of the areas that changed his world so much was when the rabbi kept on speaking to him, kept on schooling him and, and kept on stretching his understanding and knowledge of who he thought God was. And in John 3.16, you remember the very start, which sometimes we've got to go back to move forward. So we want to land in John 3.16, but we have to go back to that, that cafe session with Nicodemus and Jesus. But now here's what Jesus says. And it says in verse 16, probably the most famous scripture in the entire world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. Some of you are judging me right now because I had to read that. And most of us grew up with it on the back of our toilet door. And if you spend a lot of time in the toilet, uh, hiding away from doing the dishes, you should know that memory. Uh, you should know that verse by memory. You see, Nicodemus understood some of that truth. But the truth that Nicodemus understood was for God so loved the Jews. And everything in his teaching as a teacher, as a Pharisee, taught him that obeying the laws and the culture and everything else and the commandments, God so loved the Jews. And here was this rabbi that said, for God so loved the world. And in a moment, Nicodemus' box that he's placed Jesus in is blown away. He now sees that the God that he thinks he knows, he doesn't really know. But that God is getting bigger every moment. God doesn't just love the Jews. He loves everyone. He loves everyone. And Luke, in Luke, we would see this later when the disciples say, teach us how to pray. The first thing Jesus says is, our father. It's the Jews' father. It's, it's the Greeks' father. It's the Italians. I don't know, were they in the New Testament? I got carried away. Uh, but it's the Greeks and it's the, it's the Romans and it's everyone. It's the Gentiles. It's the heathens. 
our Father who art in heaven. Everyone has access to Him. John 3.16, church, is a, is, is, is a scripture that stands outside time. So Nicodemus' mind has been blown because Jesus is saying, My Father, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus is saying, My Father loves you so much. He loves everyone that's died, everyone that is right now, and everyone that will be at some point along the timeline of this life. And Nicodemus is beginning to see and understand a little bit. I've got to do life differently. And maybe that's in line with being born again spiritually. Maybe if I'm born again spiritually, it will bypass everything in my world that I think I know that is holding me back. And we see in John chapter 19 that Nicodemus is starting to move past a lot of what he thinks he knows to a place where he can be in a personal relationship with God the Father. And he buries Jesus. Here's where I want to land today. And then I'm going to pray for you. I hope you've got something out of this. And I pray that I've done this justice. But here's the thing. Nicodemus' name actually means victory of the people. Maybe, just maybe, there were people, there were other Pharisees watching his world unfold. There were other Jews watching his world unfold. And as he got the revelation that God is bigger than I believe, that God is greater than I think, and his life started to play out that way, that maybe it's not about commandments, but it's about relationship. Maybe it's not about a ruler ushering in a new world. It's about the Savior ushering in a new life. And maybe that was the purpose of Nicodemus' life, that maybe he was a victory of the people because people could see that there was a better way to do life. Can I pray for you? Father, if there's anyone that's listening to the sound of my voice and watching this online that is struggling to believe how great you are, God, I just pray that they would almost have the spirit of Nicodemus, just that inquiring and then finding a small, still voice and then allowing the discipleship to play out and manifest through their hands and through their feet. Father, I love the contrast of this scripture between John, who knew who you were, writing this down, and Nicodemus questioning who you were and Jesus knowing who he was. I love that, Father, we love the Bible. It is a beautiful gift that you've given us. Let us never grow weary of reading it. But if there's anyone out there inquiring of who you are, Father, I pray that by the sound of my voice and the power of your Holy Ghost, they would get great revelation. And even right now as I'm praying, God, they would just sense your spirit blessing them. In Jesus' name right now, fill the room up with angels where they're at. Let them know. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Guys, you've been amazing. A little bit quiet, but amazing. Be blessed until next time. Take care. Hey, Wine Press. Firstly, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And the great thing about Church Online, you can catch us anywhere, anytime, anywhere in the world. Like, subscribe, and we can come into your home anytime you want. Love you heaps. Take care.